appreciation for uh, Comrades uh, Tafari uh, and Comrade Secretary General Louisa Kinshasa uh, for participating in this discussion. As uh, <clears throat> we have already indicated uh, throughout this process, I think up to now. And certainly if it's not made clear, we'll talk about it uh, probably sometime tomorrow anyway, uh, that uh, in the first Congress of the African People's Socialist Party, which was held nine years after our founding, partially because of the terror that uh, the African movement uh, was still uh, undergoing here in the United States with uh, police raids on our offices and meetings and, and assassinations and uh, just a, a general kind of destabilization of our community uh, that was uh, determined to keep African people in the United States uh, out of the revolutionary project, to push us out of the revolutionary project. Uh, so in 19, uh, we were able in 1980, 81, uh, to hold our first uh, Congress. And it was also because, so we uh, have always been a, like a working class party and didn't, and they really didn't have experience in doing things that building Congresses. Uh, and uh, so that was another reason. I mean, we had no experience in doing that. And there's not uh, that much experience in the African liberation movement, especially as it relates to the United States. And I think generally speaking, it was true about our struggles everywhere of, of having Congresses. Well, we did have this Congress and our inexperiences reflected in the fact that uh, for that political, for that uh, first uh, 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 Congress of the party in 1981, I actually wrote two political reports uh, with different names. But uh, one of the things that we did, we passed a resolution uh, calling for the creation of an African uh, Socialist International. We did this because we were uh, uh, tired of seeing what was happening to our Africa, uh, how uh, all around the world, Africans were trying to struggle to make uh, revolutionary transformation change uh, in our conditions of existence and how uh, the Soviet Union, which was the uh, premier uh, uh, recognized uh, uh, communist organization globally had created uh, 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 a communist international and had determined uh, that there were only uh, six uh, authentic revolutionary organizations in Africa, in all of Africa. And based on this determination, they gave training and resources and to those uh, six others like uh, ZANU, the Zimbabwe African National Union, like the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, uh, like uh, the uh, Southwest African National Union, <clears throat> and others who were out there struggling uh, had to uh, uh, rely on whatever kinds of resources could be scrapped up and leaving uh, some of them actually uh, going in very reactionary directions. But the problem was, we believe, I was convinced at the time, uh, that Africa, uh, although we may be poor and very, uh, generally speaking, uh, individually, collectively, we have enough uh, resources and we have enough uh, both human and material uh, to be able uh, to unite the African revolution uh, and to determine ourselves what was a legitimate revolutionary uh, organization, what was legitimate uh, in terms of uh, the struggle of African people. And so we created the African Socialist International. And I traveled uh, various places throughout Europe, uh, <clears throat> especially uh, meeting with Africans, trying to track down, locate uh, African uh, revolutionaries that we could, organizations that we could bring into this, uh, this association, this African Socialist International. It didn't work that way. Uh, but we were influenced uh, by several things. One is that we kept running into uh, some resistance by Pan-Africanists. And as, as you know, uh, the Pan-Africanists were forces who became political forces uh, in, in the struggle against Marcus Garvey and African fundamentalism. And W.E.B. Du Bois was one of the main uh, forces here, but there were others uh, as well. And, and, and the, the effects of uh, the struggle about the Pan-Africanists to undermine Garvey uh, undermine philosophically the whole notion of Africa for Africans and that Africa is our homeland. Uh, that effect continues to uh, be devil uh, struggle that we're involved in today. 
And uh, so uh, we ran into a several Pan-Africanists and we tried to talk to build this and it didn't work. So, but we convinced that uh, Garvey was correct that, that it is possible to have and we must have a single revolutionary organization uh, that uh, embraces Africans all around the world with a single center, uh, as opposed to this Pan-Africanist uh, uh, tendency that uh, just recognize any entity that wanted to characterize itself as a Pan-Africanist and any uh, uh, force in the world as a part of some kind of Pan-Africanist Congress or conference or something to that effect. We want to build a revolutionary organization. The objective is to take power. That's what Garvey was about. He wasn't just building organizations in order to hold parades and do things like that. The objective is to take power, building a movement that would take power, actually take power. And he built uh, many of, uh, and the processes, he built many of the, of the actual and symbols of, of state power <clears throat> uh, and actually uh, created a kind of dual power, uh, uh, institutionalized economic uh, uh, work uh, in the African community with a clear objective of, of harnessing all of the, uh, the economic resources in the African community toward African interests. That's what motivated Garvey. That's what he was dealing with. And of course, uh, we had a situation that, that uh, there was a, a general kind of consciousness within the African world uh, about our struggle against white colonial uh, domination. And of course, in 1963, uh, there was a conference that was held uh, in Addis Ababa, uh, 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 Ethiopia. And this was a conference uh, uh, that was uh, a Pan-Africanist based kind of conference. Uh, it was uh, designed uh, to, uh, to build a whole movement instead of African people. But what it actually was about uh, was uh, contending with work by Kwame Nkrumah, uh, who had begun meetings as early as 1957, 58, uh, trying to organize Africans who had achieve independence, revolutionary forces who were struggling to win freedom uh, into uh, 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 a movement uh, to create uh, an, an African state that would not only defeat uh, colonialism as it represented itself in, as white power, but also uh, take on the whole uh, struggle against uh, neo-colonialism as he understood it at the time. And uh, in 1963 in Addis Ababa, uh, Nkrumah failed uh, and this, uh, this institution that was uh, funded by, supported by the colonial powers of the world and did everything to make sure that Nkrumah could not be uh, influential and successful. And so uh, it was at this time in 1963 where the Organization of African Unity, as it was called, actually codified, legalized, and validated the colonial borders. In fact, uh, part of the charter of the Organization of African Unity uh, 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 declared that there would be no change in the colonial borders. <clears throat> and and uh, so that's where we first see uh, the emergence of the recognition and validation of this, this body, uh, uh, this, this whole, uh, uh, we have a neo-colonial, uh, uh, African-wide neo-colonial entity uh, that has now uh, defined the struggle of black people according to uh, the colonial borders that were created by white power. And that's what we're fighting against. And that gives us an opportunity to fight against neo-colonialism, helps us to recognize that neo-colonialism is a part of the struggle we're involved in. Today, we live in a situation that has some similarities to the era of crisis that Garvey lived in, where uh, the, the, there was a, a disorder uh, under the world, the first imperialist world war uh, to, to redivide the world had occurred uh, and did occur. Uh, there, there were efforts being made to, uh, to parcel out parts of Africa to different white countries and white people, and Garvey uh, was there. So this whole contradiction, confrontation between the colonial powers uh, was something, and Africans were engaged in struggle everywhere, and we have a similar situation here uh, today that we are confronted with, and people want revolution. People want meaningful transformation. And what we are seeing is that the African working people are tired of this kind of belly crawling politic uh, that uh, tries to integrate into the existing social system and they want revolution. And so that's what we're talking about. We talk about the redemption of Africa in our lifetime is we begin the process some time ago of constructing a capacity uh, to take that, constructing it by organizationally, 
at constructing it ideologically, politically, and, and what have you, and trying to create the cadre, revolutionary cadre, uh, that is prepared to do whatever is necessary to win the liberation of our Africa, to achieve the discipline, to achieve uh, the uh, ideological, uh, necessary ideological and political development to make that happen. So I wanna just say that to introduce this discussion and then turn it over to Comrade Louis de Kinshasa. As it all has been said, he is the Secretary General uh, of the African Socialist International Work. Uh, Comrade Louis de Kinshasa is from Congo. Uh, he is uh, uh, currently uh, living uh, in England uh, where he uh, has been in exile sometime after first uh, going to France uh, and, and now he is in England and has the basic responsibility uh, for organizing the African Socialist International. In Africa, uh, in, it's located uh, in occupied Zania, referred called uh, South Africa by its colonial name, Kermit Tafari Mugheri, uh, who is the director of organization for Africa work, uh, uh, will also be participating uh, in this discussion. So I want to just turn it over to you two comrades. Uhuru, Comrade Secretary General. Uhuru, Chairman. Uhuru, I uh, just want to salute Chairman O'Malley for his uh, relentless effort uh, to build the African People's Socialist Party. I want to salute the uh, National Central Committee of the African People's Socialist Party. I want to salute the entire whole movement for putting together this powerful plenary. And I want to salute our distinguished guests for their uh, brilliant uh, solidarity messages. Uh, I just want to say uh, I'm just, uh, you know, uh, proud, you know, honored uh, just to be part of this uh, 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 panel of this workshop because uh, with uh, African internationalism, we have a clear sense of our mission, uh, of this process we're looking into. We know how this colonial capitalism uh, was built. We also know how it's going to be destroyed. So when we say the redemption of Africa in our lifetime, we are we're saying it with confidence because we understand, as I said, how this process was built. And we have a sense of uh, significance of the role of African people, particularly African working class, in this process to eradicate colonialism, global colonialism, as the foundation upon which capitalism was created. You can't have capitalism without colonialism. So we understand that, and we're saying, uh, we're saying it to everybody, to ourselves and to the whole world, that global colonialism depends on an African, African nation being basically the pedestal, the starting point, and reorganizing to end that relationship, and reorganizing with confidence. As I said, we have been able, with uh, African internationalism, to have a theory that explains not just to Africans, but to everybody on the planet is there is no mysterious capitalism because we know is global colonialism colonization of africans colonization of indigenous people in the americas theft of africa theft of the americas theft of the resources in the middle east and the asia we understand it and we want the people also to understand it every way and that's why we speak about it with uh, confidence and uh, we involved in a process where African working class has to capture power. We talked a lot about cultural revolution, the existence, the creation, the development of uh, African internationalism of the African People's Socialist Party into African Socialist International, because African Socialist International is basically the African People's Socialist Party on a global scale, is the driving of the change in the world. We're talking about cultural revolution in uh, African community on a large scale. The starting point is the creation and the development of the African People's Socialist Party. Is uh, around 
our party, that the culture revolution is going to happen is around our party, that the work to destroy colonialism as the foundation, as the pedestal of capitalism is happening and is going to develop. And uh, we know uh, that with uh, African internationalism and with the African Socialist International, we have a new vision of the future. We have a new vision of, our, of ourselves. We have a new vision of the role and the place of African people in the world. We have a new vision of the world because we are organizing to build a new world where there will be no colonial capitalism at all. As you all know, that will be replaced with socialism. And that's what Chairman O'Malley said a long time ago, the road to socialism is painted uh, black. So this is the significance uh, of it. So we are deepening the meaning of anti-colonial struggle today. We are totally, as you, you know, opposed to neocolonialism, which is a reform of colonialism. In order to save colonialism from black revolution, they have to kill uh, Palis Rumumba, they have to kill Malcolm X, they have to kill Guevara, uh, and uh, you know leaders like that just to save colonialism. And in neocolonialism, the administration of colonialism is handed over the, to the African petty bourgeoisie. So that's why we shouldn't allow anyone to say black people failed, or black people are worst enemy. No, the African petty bourgeoisie betrayed the revolution. The African petty bourgeoisie is the enemy from within. So white colonial governors are replaced by African petty bourgeoisie. When we used to have a white man or a white woman being a governor uh, in Ghana or you know anywhere uh, in Africa, now you have a Mr. Black President or Mr. Prime Minister, something like that. The African administrators of colonialism will do everything the white colonial governors used to do directly to us. Don't make any mistake. The African petty bourgeoisie, in order to defend colonialism, must do the things the colonial governors used to do. Shoot other people, murder, assassinate other freedom fighters. Uh, Today we have mass graves all over Africa, in Sudan, in the Congo, in Rwanda, in Uganda. You have mass graves and the African petty bourgeoisie organized those mass graves in collaboration with the United government or French government or British government and so on, but they did it. So there should be no hesitation, no really uh, confusion that the African petty bourgeoisie has to be removed from power. We have uh, the African petty bourgeoisie in power but it's still a colonial economy built at our expense against the African people. Remember, the African people bourgeoisie continue to transfer our gold, our diamond, our oil, our gas, our cotton, our uranium to old and new colonial countries without compensation. No African should accept it. That life is unbearable for our people everywhere and every day Tons and tons and tons of our resources are being transferred, not even sold, transferred everywhere to new and old colonial powers, everywhere. And our children are going to jail in England, going to jail in the US, in Canada, in Brazil, and all those places. It should not be tolerated. African labor is still not paid, it's just real value. People go for months in Africa or for years without being paid in Zambia, in Congo, in Guinea-Bissau. If I take Congo, for example, cotton is produced at gunpoint. The cotton is needed by the Silicon Valley. Microsoft needs cotton. Uh, Apple needs cotton. Samsung needs cotton. Away needs cotton. All these companies, all these electronic companies need cotton. But cotton is obtained, is produced at gunpoint. And uh, not only is produced at gunpoint, uh, mass rape of African women is a part of the production of coltan, tin, tungsten, uh, other material. All this is documented. Uh, so child labor is everywhere uh, in Africa. Uh, gold and cobalt mine. You go to Ghana, you go to Congo, you go to Mali, all these mines where they produce gold. Children are working there. You go to Ivory Coast where we produce cocoa children are working there so that's colonialism that's no super exploitation or anything that's the norm that's how capitalism works it cannot work without colonialism and you cannot have colonialism without 
genocide of our African people. We fought rape of African women. We fought exploitation for African children. That's how he was born. That's how it's maintained. That's how it works today. It doesn't matter if you talk about last century or this century. That's how you know colonial capitalism uh, definitely work. So with African internationalism, we know the work of Marcus Garvey, the work of Malcolm X, of Luke Patricia Mumba, of Kwame Nkrumah, of Steve Biko, of Fred Hampton, all these leaders who came before us, we can say they did not die in vain because there is a continuity of their work through the African People's Socialist Party. Not only there is a continuity through African internationalism, now we can see the crisis of colonial capitalism everywhere. Crisis everywhere we begin to see the masses of africans demanding for example that the french colonizers to leave mali we haven't heard anything like this from since the 60s now it's happening which means if it's happening in mali you should hear that you know in another country in africa you should hear that in the united states or brazil or somewhere else but africans begin to demand colonizers must go so we have to generalize that demand because it's not just uh, in Mali. It should happen everywhere. Colonialism must be eradicated. And uh, now we are in a better situation. Not only are we demanding that the African masses have access for the first time to their own working class, to their own revolutionary organization. That's the African Socialist International. As I say, it's the African People's Socialist Party on a global scale. We are there. We are in many places around the world. We are not yet the strongest yet, but we are growing. We are everywhere. So this is also an aspect of the crisis. That's why we can say with confidence, we can see the redemption of Africa and of African people everywhere. And that redemption cannot just happen uh, because we we talking about it it's gonna happen because we have a revolutionary organization they can't be black freedom without total decolonization they can't be total decolonization without a worldwide black revolution and they can't be a worldwide revolution without the building on the ground everywhere where african people are located the african socialist international this has to be done. If you want to see black freedom, you have to be part of this uh, party. You have to participate on a building on the ground, the African Socialist International. This is the vehicle to the African redemption. When you see African Socialist International, you are looking at the redemption of uh, Africa and African people everywhere. And uh, remember, France and all white colonial capitalist nations did not accept the Asian Revolution because they were able to isolate the Asian Revolution despite the heroic uh, Africans in Haiti and uh, the inspiration you know they gave to all of us at the time. That's why our revolution has to be a worldwide revolution by its very nature at the inception. It has to be a African revolution, a worldwide one. We do rap music, we do reggae everywhere, we mobilize, you know, for George Floyd everywhere at the same time. We must mobilize for revolution at the same time, in the same organization, with the same philosophy, and the redemption of Africa requests that we intensify access to each other's. Uh, we should not be isolated as the colonialism has imposed on us. Uh, we have to beat the colonial borders, the colonial immigrations, and the require and the requirement of visa for example for africans going back home you need a visa to go to ghana to go to nigeria that should not be accepted any african going home we should go free no visa should be required for any african going home and uh and this is necessary in a process of completing the black revolution which i said once again is the complete overthrow of colonialism as the global colonial mode of production you will hear no other organization saying this unless they heard it from Chairman of Mali or they heard it from the African Peace Society Party. So this is our mission is basically to destroy the global uh, colonialism as the foundation upon which capitalism rests, is to build a black power state. You can't talk about redemption of Africa without power. So that's why we're talking of the necessity that power has to become a demand from everywhere, from 
all black community just as chairman said some 40 years ago or that uh reparation demand has to become a household uh name so the demand for black power international black power state international african power state has to become a demand of every black host household on the planet because we need that uh, power so we can have a united state of africa and we can have a united african nation all of black people are part of the african nation and this the struggle for nationhood we don't have a nation we don't have a state our nation is dispersed fragmented and uh it can only become a reality if our homeland is free and united and african internationalism once again is the road to african nationhood that's why you know the uh, leadership of chairman of mali is so significant is so is historical because it's just he's been able to solve all the, the the questions left unresolved from the 60s and we just continuing you know uh with uh uh with the uh legacy basically with everything he has been able to uh, to give to us so complete the black revolution to make that happen uh as i said we already have a revolutionary philosophy sitting organization international black power state the process to negate a colonial economy and replace it with our own black power international economy and you will see the report tomorrow coming for example from dc owner uh you've seen already some examples during the black power uh sales just today you will see the significance of building a black power uh economy it has to be an international economy we have to have access to our own resources we must have access to each other and we have definitely build an economy based on satisfying the demand and aspiration of our people everywhere and uh in the in the 60s no one builds a party uh uh to take uh, power from uh, the white colonizers and uh and not controlled by the African petty bourgeoisie. We had organizations in the 60s, but you didn't have organization built to take power from white power to destroy the colonial state and also not to be controlled by the Af African petty bourgeoisie. It did not happen. And uh, that's why we are we're making history because now we have a political organization. We have a philosophy created from the very beginning to arm the African working class to fight for power not just any power but to fight for international power and uh this will require uh basically uh for everyone who's listening if you believe you're done with that you know you should just go to apspo.org and begin your process you know to become uh, a member i want to end by saying this we know the african people bourgeoisie has been dominating the landscape everywhere for a long time but now African international is coming. They can't continue to do that. You know, the days are of African petty bourgeoisie are definitely numbered. They no longer uh, can enjoy the monopoly of of power, the monopoly of electoral politics, and things like that. Just think about it. A country like China, 1.5 or 1.4 billion people. Nobody is starving. Nobody goes hungry. Everybody has access to clean water and electricity and you, you go to black community you go to jamaica three million people life is problematic in jamaica you go to gabon less than three million people life is po is problematic when you take a country like congo alone can feed you know as many people as people are they are in india because the size is a bit similar and india has 1.3 billion people can you just see that now put all africa together and we're starving that should not be accepted is a creation of colonialism we should have the best the best life on the planet because we have all the resources and they are soon probably two billion of us so if it took china 50 billion 50 years to be where they are after making the chinese revolution so africa when the black revolution is completed with all the resources we have it should not take us 50 years it should take us maybe 10 years someone told me maybe five years just to redeem african lives so we can have a, a life of dignity so this is doable it's doable because we have the science to make it happen only thing is missing is make the revolution complete the revolution that's what we need you to embrace the united with african internationalism and uh, you will hear uh, my comrade uh, director uh, tafai will speak uh, on this issue 
we have everything. We have the original strategies. We have the mass organization. We solve the, you know, the white people question. We have the solidarity. So we open the door even to uh, the colonizers to join the revolution to basically, we have been able to split the oppressor white nation. This is a tremendous, that's a brilliant strategy. We have done it and we're building you know, we're expanding on it everywhere that the oppressor white nation can be divided, which means that cannot win against us because we have people who are working behind the enemy lines. That's the power of African internationalism. We're doing it. So I just want everyone who is a, who's listening, if you're not a member, African, anywhere, you cannot justify not being in support. If you can't be a member, not being in support, of black power life begins life dignity begins with we as a people having access to international black power so why can't you join it if you can't why can't you support it so we should be becoming intolerant you know that africans you know are on the sidelines or doing other things no revolution has to become the order of the day. We are in a hurry. Our young people demanding it, and I unite with them. Revolution now. We want it now. Join the APSP today. So I want to thank uh, once again everyone who worked hard to put this together. This is a great plenary. This is a process to get the African working class to you to learn how to use the rule. You know, this way, this best solve problems and manage it on affairs. That's what's happening now. We're learning how to manage our own affairs. So the African working class is learning how to become the new ruling class. You know, this in itself is a part of the redemption of Africa. So it's not happening in the near future. The process is ongoing. So join us today. Join us today. So I'll stop here. Who, uh, comrade, who the chairs? Uh, Erika and Abdullah. Great chairing, by the way. Who are comrades? Okay. Uhuru. Yeah, Uhuru comrades. Um, Missy. Yeah, I hope uh, none of you comrades in the audience uh, wish to be in my position right now because it's it's not going to be easy speaking after you know two of the greatest revolutionaries alive right now, S. G. Luwezi, uh, Kinshasa, and uh, my chairman Omalie Uh But then um. Yeah, as it has been said, I am Tafari Mugeri, and I am the director of organization for the African People's Socialist Party uh, in Africa, as well as the chair of the party here in Occupy Tanzania. I, I want to salute, um, you know, the leadership of Chairman Omalia Shitela, who is the leader and founder of our movement, and, uh, you know, the etiquette uh, of, um, of African internationalism. And, uh, and I also want to salute my direct leadership S.G. Luwezi, as well as the entire National Central Committee um, of the African People's Socialist Party. And I just want to give a salute to, um, you know, to the MCs, as well as this entire plenary conference. Um, yeah, I'm going to speak um, uh, in my capacity as the director of organization for Africa, but I also want to speak as, as a young person, you know, uh, because, um, like just looking at the fact that we were born, uh, you know, we are a generation that was born from the defeat of the Black Revolution. Like here in Occupy Tanzania, we had to discover the, or be discovered by the Uhuru movement for us to know that we can be revolutionaries. Had it not been for the African People's Socialist Party, we would be part of something else out there, but then not in the same trajectory that the great Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, Robert Sobukwe, and uh, and uh, like the likes of uh, Kwame Nkrumah were on. So we're saying that this continuum that we are speaking of in terms of the Black Revolution of the 1960s up to now, we are only able to be able to express it and be able to live it because of, of what um, you know, the chairman and the African People's Socialist Party have done to make sure that we continue in the same path. We never compromise, we never deviate and go to some compromise that will actually ultimately, uh, you know, tarnish the future of, of, of African people permanently. So I am absolutely grateful to, uh, to the African People's Party and the Uhuru movement. And 
I just want to give a, a warning to every young person that could be watching this right now, that there is an emergence actually of young opportunists, young people that just want to take uh, you know, advantage of the fact that uh, masses of African people are not have been removed, pushed out of political life completely. And they are careers, they are part of uh, you know, some, some trajectory that is outside of uh, you know, just winning the total uh, liberation and redemption of Africa. They want to perpetuate neocolonialism. They want to inherit, inherit uh, neocolonialism. Here in South Africa, you have these young, young, young people that proclaim pan-Africanism and some other version of neocolonialism that's out there. And they do this in a very bold way. They go out there being live all the time. Sometimes they are on the streets. Sometimes we, we see them on the news, on the televisions and so forth. And part of why they have the courage and the space to do that is because the genuine forces are not out there. We don't go out there with determination, with uh, the confidence, you know, uh, we have to be out there and be able to challenge all these opportunists out there because we have the African Pixelist Party, we have the Uhuru Movement, and we have a philosophy that can defend us. Nothing out there in the world uh, can challenge African internationalism. There's no one that can come with any other philosophy uh, and be able to win against um, African internationalism. So I, I want to say that and to say to young people that we have to take this on uh, and, and take Africa to its you know, like um, total liberation and redemption. And um, I just want to, uh, to be able to speak about um, why we are here. And we, we are here because we are colonized and we are colonized wherever we are. All the challenges that we are confronted with as African people is because it's due to the fact that we live under colonial domination, white power colonial domination. And we have come here to this plenary and, uh, and actually, for those of us that are members of the Uhuru Movement and the African Socialist Party, we are here because we don't accept it. We cannot accept that Africa is dominated. We cannot accept even however colonialism or imperialism can suggest that we can get, you know, like something out of it, we can get a share out of it or whatever the case may be. We're saying that no, we want the total liberation of Africa. We want to be self-determining. We want African people to govern Africa. That's why we're saying that the Uhuru movement is the best vehicle for us to get there. Because if we just wanted uh, to be included in the system, uh, we would be somewhere else. But we are here because we're saying that there is no way that African people can uh, achieve self-determination uh, without the total destruction of this whole so foul social system. So part of the reason that... Uh, like attracted me to the African People's Socialist Party, to uh, the Uhuru movement is because uh, I, I could see that, uh, like we believe in what we say. When we say Africa will be free, when we say African redemption in our lifetime, we believe it. When we say that the total liberation of Africa in Chairman Omali Yeshitela's time, we believe it. And we believe that we are going to win. It's not something that we say because it's fancy to say, or maybe it's trending or something. We say that because we know that African people are uh, being oppressed, being colonized, cannot you know, live under these conditions forever. People will continue to resist, but then the role of us as the vanguard, as the, uh, as the, as the leadership of the African revolution, our responsibility is to provide direction to that resistance that we are seeing all over the place. We're seeing movements across the continent right now. We're seeing movements even in Europe or even in the Americas. You know, um, but then we're saying that it's not enough to simply resist. We have to have uh, to be able to answer the question of to what, to what end? And we're talking about a liberated, unified socialist Africa. So there's a question of how do we get there? So this is why I appreciate uh, the chairman, Omali Yeshitela, because he has been able to respond and answer that question of how do we get there? We need organization. That's why we have the African People's Socialist Party. And we have an organization that's able to unite us wherever we are. Because we, we don't even have to have all sorts of movements, just to be honest. Because why African people are one. And we are all colonized wherever we are. So if you're all fighting against colonialism, 
then we have to come to the same conclusion of saying that the way for us to be free is if we destroy this colonialism. And the colonialism has manifested itself in all sorts of ways. We have all these borders that separate us in Africa. I am here in South Africa, but then I, I cannot go to, um, uh, to Ghana freely. I have to apply for some visa and uh, you know my visa application may be declined, but I am right here in Africa. But then someone from Europe or someone from the uh, United States can freely come to Africa and roam around or even go on some uh, game reserve and be able to, uh, you know, to hunt some animals and things like that. But then in, in, in Africa, as an African, I cannot do any of that, those things because why? I'm colonized. Africa does not belong to me right now. It's not in my hands. It's in the hands of the oppressor, in the hands of the, of the, of, of the colonizers. So we have a responsibility as, as, uh, as revolutionaries to be able to do what, uh, to, to respond and say that we need organization, but also we need philosophy. We need theory. That's what uh, Chairman Omali Shichela has been emphasizing. That's why we are African internationalists, because we can all claim to be all black and wanting revolution and freedom. But then if we don't have the same philosophy, if we don't have a philosophy that's able to, uh, to explain to us the world as it is, then we come to different conclusions. And then we cannot properly organize. We cannot go to the same direction. That's why we have to win the masses of the African working class to African internationalism. Right now, here in Africa, our party is growing in leaps and bounds. In West Africa, we have the party and party mem membership in, uh, in Sierra Leone, uh, in Liberia, in Ghana, in Cote d'Ivoire, um, also in Central Africa, in, in Central Africa, in, in Chad, but also in East Africa, we are there in, in Uganda. Comrade N is there in Uganda. And then uh, we, we also are there in, in, in Kenya, also in Tanzania but also here in Southern, Afri Southern Africa, where we'll be hosting our um, uh, 2023 uh, 8th Congress of the African People's Socialist Party here in South Africa. We are there in South Africa, but we are also there in Swaziland right now. Comrade Zwani is there in Swaziland. And we're able to do this because we build around a strategy. And this strategy has been laid out by, uh, by our leadership, Chairman Omali Ishitela, and we refer to it as the regional strate strategy. And this is not something that we are just proclaiming or you know, some wishful declarations. There is evidence of practical struggle that has been engaged in since the last 50 years or so. We have, if you look at our work in the United States of America, we have demonstrated how Africa could look like if we are preparing to govern right now. Because when you talk about the redemption of Africa, we want to redeem Africa because African people were once free. We're not fighting for something that's just out there imaginary, like, like some people will claim that uh, we're just fighting. Our, our, our struggle uh, began on some slave plantation. We're saying African people were once free. And to be free means that you are self-governing. That's why we have institutions uh, in the United States right now. We have uh, you know, uh, Uhuru Bakeries. We have uh, the um, Black Power Blueprint in St. Louis. We have the gym in, uh, in St. Petersburg, and we have Zenzele consignment in, um, in Huntsville. All these institutions demonstrate to us that we are preparing ourselves to take on Africa. You know, so we are ready to do that. So it is a practical struggle that we are engaged in. So I just wanna uh, be able to, um, to appreciate the party for even declaring that African internationalism is a theory of, uh, of practice. And we can be able to embrace the entire African nation. That's why we have all these mass organizations. Right here in Occupy Lazania, we have the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement. And uh, it fights for the democratic rights of African people. And we have said that uh, you know, um, self-determination is the, is the highest expression of, of democracy. And we have the African National Women's Organization. So African women don't have to go to some direction, some neo-colonial direction, uh, uh, to, to be able to, to address some of the immediate and concrete and real issues that uh, they're preoccupied about. They can be part of the African revolution. Everyone can be part of the African revolution. We have the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project. Abdeb, Comrade Asa is leading Abdeb here in Occupy Lazania, and we are doing the same in Sierra Leone. So the African People's Socialist Party is well equipped to take us there to the redemption of Africa. 
there's no other organization that is building uh, in, in this kind of, uh, um, you know, within this kind of strategy. You know, like here in Occupied Azania in South Africa, we had um, in the last election, more than 500 political organization campaigning, but all those organizations are fighting to save South Africa. They are talking about how our democracy is being compromised by the ANC and so forth. So they are fighting to be the better ANC. They want to preserve South Africa, but South Africa is colonialism. South Africa was born through the attack on Africa. South Africa was not born to save African people. We were free. But then South Africa came as a consequence of African people being dominated. So if you want to preserve South Africa, then you want to preserve the colonial domination of African people. But then because we have African internationalism, we can say that, no, we don't see a future within South Africa. We see a future within a liberated Africa that can only emerge at the expense of South Africa, Nigeria, and all these colonial entities that were built at, and are maintained at our expense right now. So we want a totally unified, totally liberated Africa, one economy and uh, one nation, one state that can actually ensure that all African children in Africa can eat. Right now in South Africa, in this South Africa, that's supposed to be the most uh, you know, advanced economy in, um, in, in the continent. Um, you find that youth, African youth right now in, in South Africa, they mentioned last year that 72% of young people are unemployed and over about 40, 42% of the entire population is unemployed. Right now in South Africa, that's the reality. What is happening with all these people that uh, do not have uh, an income? These are the African people that are they're waiting for us to make an intervention to come and say that the only way we can be free is not for us to wait for some white men to come somewhere and build a factory in our community. We can be free by uh, being able to capture Africa for our own self because Africa is rich in mineral resources and we have the skills right now. We have acquired the skills. We can build our own economy. The issue that we have right now is political. It's, it's a political issue because we don't have political power. We have been removed out of political life. If we can capture um, you know, the, uh, African people politically, then we can be able to define what politics mean. Because right now under the ANC in South Africa, politics means that uh, you're gonna wait uh, and, and uh, for the next election after five years and then you vote after voting, you go back and sit and just go hungry again. But then we're saying that politics is concentrated economics. So we can solve the economic question of employment, of resources and so forth by winning on the political uh, on the political front. So that's what we are engaged in. So we're saying the African working class have to emerge through the Uhuru movement. The African working class must emerge through the African People's Socialist Party. And we are determined to do that. That's why we build, we're building this party in the, in the working class communities all over South Africa. We're doing that in Swaziland. We're doing that in West Africa, also in East Africa. And um, you should just look out for uh, all the developments that, that are going to be taking place in, here in, on the African continent. Uh, we are preparing for, for the 2023 um, International Congress of the African People's Socialist Party. And we're going to embrace all African people. We're going to embrace you from the United States, uh, from Europe, uh, from all over the world. African people must uh, descend here on, on, the, on, on in, um, in Occupy Azania in South Africa for the eighth Congress. So I just want to salute this uh, plenary conference, salute the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party, salute Chairman Omali Shitela and all the comrades that have um, you know, co co converged here on this uh, historic event. So Uhuru. Oh. Uhuru, Uhuru, thank you. I just want to uh, salute this entire panel. Um, it's truly been an honor to participate today. Um, it looks like we have a couple of questions for our panelists. Um, and each of you can feel free to take it on um, if you'd like. We've got some time for that. But the question comes from Larry Ball on Facebook. And it reads, does the party allow religious freedom? 
does the party allow religious freedom? I don't understand the question. We are not a religious organization. Um, and our organization is based in philosophical materialism and not idealism. But the truth of the matter is that people have come into our party uh, who are religious. And I imagine that there are people who uh, hold some religious beliefs who are in the party right now. Uh, but the fact is that uh, we think that any form of philosophical idealism ultimately uh, leads us to a dead end. And that uh, our objective, even with people who may come into the party uh, as, as uh, religious believers, as philosophical idealism, whether it's religion or whether it's some other form of, uh, of uh, idealism, uh, our objective is to win them uh, while in the process of making the struggle. So generally speaking, unless uh, somebody suggest that they cannot come into the party uh, or that uh, coming into the party means that the party has become a religious organization or facilitate their religious beliefs or something to that effect. But generally speaking, uh, people uh, do come into the party, many of whom are religious. And uh, some come into the party who are religious and uh, or who come into our movement who are religious and decide that they can't come into the party and they work in some other organization that's led by the African People's Socialist Party. But we are not uh, uh, an organization based on oppressing uh, anybody because of religion. In fact, uh, the truth of the, of the matter is that the African People's Socialist Party, our organization, our membership is uh, uh, more likely to defend uh, the religious rights and freedoms of, uh, of African people uh, than, uh, than even the the clerics, the preachers, and things like that who uh, talk about uh, religion as uh, the only way forward. We believe in absolute and total liberation. We believe that real freedom, freedom is recognition of necessity. And, we, and what that means in part, uh, recognition of necessity uh, really helps to move us beyond uh, superstition, philosophical idealism, and what have you, uh, and put us on a trajectory that can win the material uh, freedom of our people, which contributes to the spiritual freedom liberation. By spiritual, I'm not using this in some way that uh, people often use to, <clears throat> to talk about being religious. I'm, I'm talking about, uh, I'm talking about the, oh, in James Brown, I'm talking about uh, that which uh, makes us up, you know, uh, as people, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, so, uh, and you don't have to be religious uh, to have that, uh, Uhuru. Ooh, like that owl. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Yeah. Comrade, sorry. Oh, uh, Uhuru, comrade. I don't think I have much to, to add. I just unite with... Um, with everything that the chairman has uh, has said, and it's true that we do have um, people that are religious in 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 the party, you know. Um, and uh, so I, I I've never experienced you know um, like any you know like real issues. I feel uh, like actually people that join our party being religious, they experience less challenges than being elsewhere, you know, because uh, you know, we focus on the practical, you know, struggle of winning total liberation of African people. That's what we're engaged in. You know, African people are preoccupied with some some real issues, as opposed to saying that which God is the right God and and so forth. You know, that's 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 more frustrating, and you usually don't, you know, come to, you know, a, 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 a sort of consensus around that. You know. But then if you can see the police in the community, you know, you can see the cops here and you know that the cops don't solve any problem in the black community anywhere in the world, you know? And you can all agree on that. You can agree that white people here, like in the community that I live in, uh, it's a township, we live in shacks here, you know? And then just across the, you know, it's not even a highway, you know, just across the main, main road, it's, it's a white community and they have everything. We go to the white community to work, to clean their yards, uh, to work in their you know, small um, warehouses and whatever. And then, you know, and then we come back here and we still confronted with all these problems. You know, that's, that's, that's something that all of us experience as African people, you know. So um, 
it's easier for anyone to, uh, if they're really, really concerned about African people being oppressed, then they can, you know, function in the in the in the African People's Socialist Party. Oh, thank you for that, Director. Let me just add to that, if I may. Yes. Uh, because I think uh, it is extremely important to say that we are African internationalists, which is to say we do have a political philosophy and it's based on materialism, uh, philosophical uh, materialism. Uh, it is based on historical materialism. And so we seek our answers and build our policies based on that. Uh, we have no policies, none whatsoever. Uh, that has uh, uh, that has a religious basis. Uh, that this is why we do this because of some religious faith or belief. There may be in the part people in the party, and I don't know this um, from my personal experience, but there may be people in the party who do uh, work to carry out our revolutionary mission because they are influenced also by religion. As long uh, as it puts us in that trajectory, we say right on, we can, we can deal with that. But I want to say also that, you know, uh, you uh, hear all the time uh, that uh, the reason that our struggle uh, had a certain effectiveness in Haiti is because uh, of voodoo. You hear uh, from time to time. Uh, that the reason that we are not as effective in our movement is because we lost our African religion. Uh, you hear people trying to build and do build movements and organizations based on juju, voodoo, African religion, and things like that. But uh, a problem with that in part is that you cannot know uh, where the hell they are going to go. You don't know uh, where that religion is going to take them from one day to the next. Uh, we provide a scientific explanation. We say, this is how the situation that we are confronted with as a people came into existence. We know that concretely. We didn't have to, we didn't have to read a Bible or the Quran or anything like that. We know how this system came into, uh, into being. And there's nothing in the Bible that tells me how it happened. There's nothing in the Quran that tells me how this system came into being, that based on some materialist assessment. Uh, uh, and, and so, you know, that, I think that's important. And if you look at the entirety of this plenary, uh, everything has a scientific basis for what it is that we're trying to do. Uh, we don't make any jabs one way or another at somebody's religion. It has a scientific basis. It's, we say again that uh, we are materialists uh, and we believe in the dialectical process, uh, et cetera. And the other thing that's really important uh, about being materialists is we recognize, and this is extremely important to us, that we have the ability to change the world that we live in. We don't have to wait for any external forces. We don't have to pray in the right directions. Uh, we don't have to know what the chicken bones say or anything like that. We know we can change these circumstances. It was human beings who created the circumstances that Africans are confronted with. So we know that human beings can change that and we have accepted for ourselves uh, the responsibility to do that based on that knowledge, based on the fact that we create organization that will facilitate our capacity to do that, based on the fact that we also uh, develop cadre, human beings uh, who are professional revolutions. No matter what their, uh, what their occupation may be, they have uh, agreed to and united with becoming professional revolution. Revolution is our profession. We recognize that African people catch hell everywhere, that we do not have the luxury of being able to somehow wait until next year or next month, et cetera. I don't know how many Africans are gonna die within the next hour of this discussion we're having now someplace uh, in the world because of violence, because of poverty, because of colonialism. So we accept this responsibility as human beings to change this world. And what we do also is give, give every African uh, 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 an, an opportunity to participate in changing the world. You can lead, you can be the leader, you can be the force that's transforming this world. We believe that and that's what uh, uh, informs our practice and that's especially true for the African working class, that's especially true uh, for women uh, who are part of the African working class. 
to know that this world can be changed and that you have the power when organized and connected with other Africans uh, with the philosophy and organization and the political strategy to make it happen. That's what we rely on. And so if we want to understand the Bible, we study the Bible. We want to understand the world, we study the world. African internationalism takes us into an investigation uh, of the world uh, and it gives us the ability to make an analysis based on uh, that investigation. Uhuru. Uhuru, thank you for that chairman. It's that analysis that's gotten us here 50 years later. SG Wazy, be able to get you unmuted. Uh, or, yeah, I couldn't uh, amuse. Yes, uh, I just want to say I unite what I just uh, uh, heard from uh, <clears throat> from Chairman. Uh, I just want to say a few things quickly about that. Is that you can't separate uh, religion with colonialism. Uh, you know, like uh, there was no, we were not Catholics. For example, I take as an example until colonialism came, and colonialism made us Catholics. Uh, most of the schools in the Congo are run by Catholics, and uh, there is no way you can't uh, you cannot fight colonialism without fighting the organized Catholic Church because the organized Catholic Church has always been opposed to resistance in Africa and the Congo in particular, and uh, they took side at the at decisive moments when Lumumba uh, began to start to consolidate uh, its leadership. The Catholic Church came heavily against him. You know, uh, Lumumba didn't have a chance or organization to, you know, to fight back ideologically. Uh, they slandered him and, uh, you know, every day in the church, you know, the Catholic Church uh, did that. And um, so as we fight against colonialism, uh, institutions that support colonialism, you know, have to be fought against. Uh, if you take uh, Catholic Church, for example, they use la free labor. If you go to Catholic Church, they go ask to work for free in the farms and things like that. They have, they have money, they have uh, properties uh, everywhere. You know, the work is being done by African workers, not, not by the uh, bishops or cardinals. The workers did all the work. But the bishops, the cardinals, they are the rich. You know, they belong to the ruling class, they have access to resources, they have the money, they have the education, they have the prestige, they have all those things. And most of them, as I said, were opposed uh, to uh, independence. And today, most of them are still opposed to the revolution because they defend, uh, they defend basically uh, status quo. And also you have uh, not just the Catholic Church, you have a proliferation of so-called evangelical churches in a Congo, Ivory Coast, Nigeria, all those places. And uh, most of them, most overwhelming number of them, they are connected to the United States government, to the CIA, to the ruling class in Africa. And they take money from the people every day. They take money, they take time from the working class every day. Uh, some of them have uh, jet, uh, private jets, some of them have a uh, limousine, uh, you know, you have all these these things exist so the uh we are not against the people you know uh saying like uh uh they are you know they won't practice the religion things like that but we are opposed to colonialism and we are opposed to the first colonialism for things to change the african working class the african people have a massive access to revolution there is no way you, you can you, you cannot get around that revolution is to happen and uh we are with uh, people who go to church and they say in the name of uh, God or Jesus, like not turn, you know, that you go kill the slave masters, you know, Jesus and all these, you know, spiritual people uh, never ask the people money, you know, I never seen Jesus ask me for money, but you go to church in a black community every day, money and money is leaving us going to the banks, going, to, and our youth have no access to money, the police, you know, Channels are being filled up in London here uh, with uh, the black youth that have access to, no, look, to capital, but the church has our money, they take it to the banks. So 
there is a reality we need to fight against. We don't want our money to go to church. We want the money from the working class to come to the working class truck, to come to our movement, but at least to go back to the community where it came from. But the preachers that facilitate the uh, the money transfer, the resource trans, you know, transfer, just like those who are in power in Africa facilitate the transfer of our gold, the diamond, they also facilitate the transfer of our financial resources. The little money we have, they take it, and move it to the banks and move it to you know uh uh somewhere somewhere else so you take the question of indigenous people in america uh many are catholics but the reality is uh, they lost the land in america you, you've got the catholics who probably is a own uh, a land owner in the americas so the question of colonialism is really central we want indigenous people to have access to land we will have to you know expropriate the catholic church too because they are property, are landowners, you know, they have access to wealth stolen from uh, the indigenous people, and this is true all over uh, the world. So a free Africa will determine really what the spirituality is, uh, because I don't, you can't, you know, you can't say you're, you're spiritual and you are in peace with colonialism it doesn't make sense you know if you're spiritual you know it means that you must be done with revolution you go study african internationalism you know because there is not a way to be free so you want to be free come down to african internationalism you know and this is a really profound uh you know discussion that we need to to have because this question of uh, material you know material understanding of, of the world and uh i idealistic uh understanding of the world is critical to move the revolution forward so i just want to yeah to say this word well, i unite with that completely Look, i'm looking forward to that discussion that's one thing i tell people i'm like religion that's the colonial construct so. <laughs> uh we've got a little bit more time here uh so we got one more question uh comrade Mandisi, forgive me, uh, on Zoom. They said, Uhuru, question for Director Luezi or any others. In the strive to destroy colonialism, what are the strategies to strip the power from the petty bourgeoisie? Yes, well, you know, uh, we talked about a lot of things. I can just take a few. We're talking about uh, regional strategy. Regional strategy undermines the power of the African PD bourgeoisie because we don't consider the borders. We say we are in West Africa as a region. So no borders in terms of ideas, organization, work, all activity we're gonna do is a is a block, is a regional, it's a regional block. So we don't respect the borders uh, that the colonizers have imposed on us. And uh, the borders are needed by the African PD bourgeoisie to defend their powers, to defend their collaboration, their betrayal. Because you can't go there and fight, they'll say you're not from there. But in reality, the colonizers from all over the world are in every African country. They don't care about at the borders. In fact, most of those countries don't even have the technological capacity to know who's coming to their country. So it does not make sense at all. But the other thing is, the African working class must know uh, the interests. They must identify the interests of all the social forces in society. I know the interests of the mosquitoes cannot be the same as our people's interests. The mosquito want blood, our blood. So we have to be clear on that. So who wants our blood? The colonizers and the collaborators. So, and we say it all along, the African PD bourgeoisie used to dominate the political scene. All the organizations are created by them. So you go create organizations for African working class. And the vanguard of it is the African People's Socialist Party. So you have to make accessible, the people need to know the existence of the party, of African internationalism, the chairman, the leaders of the party. People need to know there is a viable response, answer, alternative. It exists. When they know it, then it's up to the forces on the ground. Are they going to implement the strategy of the party on the ground? Are they going to create the annual African National Women Organization on the ground? Are they going to create 
in freedom, your international people who democratic movement are they gonna you know that's up to the people on the ground there, but you have to help the people to identify their own interests and the interests of all the other social forces so you will know who is gonna move against you, who is against the people and things like that. Because bottom line, anybody who is not attacking colonialism is problematic because to move forward to be progressive to play any positive role you have to be on board to destroy colonialism as you know the basis upon which capitalism you know came into uh uh existence so that's basically what i can say uh or thank you secretary general all right I want to just uh, unite uh, uh, with this discussion around the African petty bourgeoisie. And uh, when we talk about the power of the petty bourgeoisie, I think it's really important for us to remember that power is concrete. It's not just some abstract concept that we have, it's concrete. And that uh, the reason the petty bourgeoisie has power in our lives, uh, in, our, our, in the colonies, because we don't have power. And the way that we negate the power of the petty bourgeoisie uh, is through organizing the African people in every place we are located to capture political power. Uh, in every community, every city, every province, every state, every territory. That's what Comrade Louise, Secretary General, when he talks about the regional strategy. It is a strategy that is designed uh, uh, to promote the capture of actual, real, concrete power. That means uh, it says something about what we have to do as organizers. It's not just enough to be able to have a good uh, a web uh, presence or something to that effect or to be social media militants. We have to organize our people where they are. We have to be on the ground in these communities. And uh, so that's the way we negate the influence of the petty bourgeoisie. We need to create a situation where nobody can function uh, in a territory where the party is located uh, without uh, the permission of the African People's Socialist Party. Uh, the African uh, working class organized to be able uh, to look out for its own interests. That's it's, it's absolutely necessary. It says something about what we have to do as a party. That's why we have the Burning Spear newspaper too. We go into every place, <clears throat> every nook and cranny. We sell that paper. We have forums and symposiums and we, intervene in every struggle that's happening in the community. They steal our children. We organize the people and we give a, a better explanation why our children are, are stolen. They kill our children. We, we organize people to resist. Uh, we, we raise the fighting capacity of the people by organizing them to resist, to demonstrate against them. And then we help the people to understand through science uh, exactly why uh, this happened. And then we bring them into actual organization. We shut the community down from any force that's hostile to the interests of the African working class and the African nation. That's concrete. And so, uh, you know, that's, that takes work. That takes a certain character of cadre, uh, a certain commitment from human beings uh, to take back our freedom, to take back our Africa, to take back every space uh, that exists and not to share it with anybody. We talk sometimes, or I make the analogy that the common a so-called uh, gang, a street organization, uh, without any political uh, education, recognizes that you've got to control turf. And most of these so-called revolutionary pretenders don't get that, and they're satisfied with getting a certain number of likes on social media, on Facebook, or something to that effect, and that's not going to get it for us. So if we want to win against the petty bourgeoisie, uh, we have to make struggle, organize the African working class in its own interest, uh, put the party and organization down. Uh, that's going to be our. Uh, that's going to be the response to the existence of the petty bourgeoisie influence. Uhuru. Uhuru. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Director Tafari. Thank you, Secretary General Lazy. Um, it looks like we're ahead of schedule. You know. <laughs> So um, we have a few more minutes. Each of you have about two minutes each, if you would like, um, before we sum up and close this discussion. If there are any lingering pieces that you'd like to follow up on. Yes, uh, 
Or, yeah, just the uh, on the question of uh, redemption of uh, of Africa. Uh, I just want Afri all Africans to really be uh, aware, to be conscious. Uh, the world is changing. A new era is up on us, and uh, the African Revolution is going to be the catalyst to accelerate and to formulate the new world we want to see. Because this world, as you know, was built uh, when the Portuguese attacked Africa. That was 1415. You know, that was 77 years before they arrived uh, in the Americas. So they've been looting and killing and kidnapping all those for 77 years. And now Africans, everyone on the planet, are becoming, are coming to the, to the conclusion we better fight colonizers and we must remove the collaborators from power. And this is something you begin to see, you begin to hear everywhere. And this is, uh, you can't, you know, look at this uh, conclusion without looking at the work of the African Peace Society Party doing. You can't look at it without considering the leadership of the chairman. Think, think about it. There is no political achievement in the last uh, 50 years anywhere on the planet uh, that is linked to any organization apart from the African Peace Society Party. You want to talk about the reparation demand is everywhere? That's the African Peace Society Party. That's African internationalism. And you want to talk about uh, people talking about black power uh, now? That's definitely has to do with the African Peace Research Party. You want to talk uh, about uh, the role of the white people? That's African Peace Research Party. Uh, so you, you talk about preparing to govern the African working class going to power? No way you will see that on the planet. No way unless you come to this, uh, this party. So the redemption of Africa, we're working. We've been working for it. Now, just a question of massifying uh, the, our conclusion, our leadership, everything. And that's why, if you're watching this program, I don't see how you can go home if you never join. If you're not a member yet, you should be a member. Because history, every cry uh, of African child, every humiliation of an African person on the planet is calling on you to join. It's calling for you to join, to be a catalyst, to bring black, to complete the black revolution of the 60s, so that the relation of Africa is real, is real. So I just want to say I'm thankful for just being part of this panelist. It's just, just great. Uh -huh. Yes, uh -huh. comrade. I just want to really express appreciation also for being part of this uh, panel. I'm um, like, uh, I am like absolutely honored, you know, and I just want to say to, you know, the comrades that are already in the, in the, in the movement, in the struggle that, uh, you know, the chairman has said that it, it's a protracted, protracted struggle, right? Uh, meaning that we have a slogan here in South Africa that says, um, uh, freedom now, inkulule gongoku. You know, like we want freedom now, you know, we don't say we want our land in the next five years or 10 years, whatever. We want it now. But then you also recognize that, it, you know, we're going to have to go through, you know, like struggles, you know, and it's not going to be easy. So if we join the movement with the assumption that it's, it's going to be smooth and you're going to keep everything that you've always had and you're just going to be, you know, it's just going to be nice and whatever. Uh, I, I don't think we are being serious if we're thinking like that, you know, like there has to be sacrifices made, you know, like, uh, and, uh, you know, Malcolm X has talked about these things anyway. And and uh, we, so I just want to say that to, to those that are already in the movement and say that we have a responsibility to give those that are not in the movement to have the courage, you know, um, to believe in it and uh, to, to feel that they want to be part of it. So. I, I salute the chairman, I salute the African People's Service Party and, you know, and, and the entire, you know, process, Ohuru. Ohuru. I want to thank you, uh, these uh, comrades, these incredible presentations that we've heard from everybody on this panel. And uh, uh, I want to say that, uh, uh, I want to respond also to uh, the words by comrade Tafari, uh, that, that uh, there is such a thing as revolutionary patience. Uh, but we demand uh, liberation now. We say, uh, we say liberation in our lifetime, my lifetime, 
uh, we have a responsibility to do that. It's a cop out otherwise. Uh, you, we, we hear people saying all the time, and we used to, uh, we may not get it in my lifetime, but my children will uh, somehow uh, make it happen. But to say that I'm voluntarily leaving this situation for my children is a cop out. And uh, the fact is we have to say in my lifetime, we have to take it down, wipe it out, destroy it. And uh, that says something about our responsibility as Africans, as human beings, uh, to be tolerant of oppression and exploitation. It is corrupting to know that you live uh, under colonial domination and to, and to, uh, to, to actually, actually uh, work with it, to actually uh, participate in that. Uh, uh, without resistance, without struggle. And the truth of the matter is that most young African people are in a permanent state of resistance. And that's what I love. I mean, people are criticizing young people all the time because this state of resistance sometimes is misdirected. Uh, sometimes it doesn't understand who the hell uh, they were fighting, what the fight is about, but they're always resistance. That's what colonialism does all the time. White man say, wear your hat this way, wear it that way. Wear your pants this way, wear it that way. The young Africans are in a permanent state of resistance. And we as revolutionaries and, and members of the African People's Socialist Party, as African internationalists, have to intervene and take the science and, and help uh, everybody to uh, come to the conclusion about what our responsibility is. We have to criticize everything about the colonial reality that we experience, everything. There's nothing in our lives uh, that should not be criticized. Uh, and that goes to the whole question of religion too. Uh, that was brought to us to, through this relationship that we enjoy most of the time with the, with the colonizer. That's what we do as a party. Uh, individuals who have not yet uh, been able to do that, who are in the party, uh, you will. I have no doubt about that because you're smart enough to come to the party. You recognize that we uh, have uh, 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 an explanation for everything and you are united with other people who take that on. Come at, uh, Secretary General Luese uh, was commenting on how uh, the neo-colonial petty bourgeoisie, uh, they facilitate the theft of oil and coal tan and cobalt and just all kinds of resources from Africa, but they do more than that. They facilitate a political economy organized around oil and coal tan and diamonds when what we might need is rice and greens and lima beans and other kinds of things as opposed to the diamonds. Diamonds have no intrinsic value at all. So uh, that's part of what they, they do. We're talking about overturning this entire social system and all the relationships and much of what they characterize as valuable will lose its value as a consequence of this revolution that we have to make. Uh, I think that uh, 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 I, I look at the, the, the question of, uh, of uh, religion uh, because uh, it, it's not just an abstract issue. Uh, we talked about Comrade Louise about what the Catholic Church has done. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, also, uh, I, I just remember uh, in 1966, on, on uh, May uh, 24th, uh, the day before Christmas, 1966, uh, five days uh, before we took the mural down, uh, the black preachers in the city of St. Petersburg got together and, uh, uh, and, and worked with the white folk to try to make sure uh, that we did not have the demonstrations that resulted in that mural coming down. The preachers did that uh, behind the backs of the people. And I happened to find out because there was somebody who I was close to and I, we invaded that. We actually had a demonstration in front of the church on December 24th, 1966, we had a protest demonstration that's on Christmas Eve. We saw in Gainesville, Florida, uh, when we organized the people, uh, African people, to be in solidarity with the Iranians after the, the, the Iranians had, uh, uh, in 1979, had captured this nest of spies that they called uh, an embassy in Tehran. And white people in America were killing people who they thought were Iranians or attacking them at the esteemed uh, uh, university uh, in, in Florida, University of Florida, they were having night rallies with bonfires and things like that, uh, talking about send the Klan uh, to Iran and send niggers go home, this kind of thing. And so we intervened as the party. The preachers got together 
and, uh, to, and asked all the African people not to come out. This is, they did this collectively. So they play a role because they have a relationship. I mean, they might have a relationship with God, uh, but sometimes I think they confuse the white man that colonizes with this God uh, because that's where they were taking directions from. And we see that all the time. There's no place where we have been working uh, that we didn't have that struggle. I agree that there have been exceptions to this. There have been you know, one or two preachers who really stepped forward, uh, uh, who took a, a serious this whole notion that somehow uh, they are uh, the pastors of, uh, of, of, of the African, African people, uh, uh, but generally speaking, that's not the case. And so uh, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, this is a really important uh, uh, plenary. And uh, we are on the road uh, uh, to our liberation. And this whole uh, thing about 50 years of uh, relentless struggle for the redemption of Africa. And I want to say that for the redemption of Africa, not for St. Petersburg, not for Brixton in London, uh, not for uh, uh, Fulkville uh, in, in, in South Africa, but for Africa, not for us in the Caribbean, all of Africa. We have assumed the responsibility that Marcus Garvey uh, took up a long time ago. And uh, uh, we are determined that African people, Africa will be redeemed. Africa will be redeemed. African people will be able to stand up to our full stature. We who brought civilization to the planet Earth will be able to stand up in dignity and get out from under the humiliating foreign and alien domination by people who only brought uh, violence uh, to our existence and the theft of our resources. So I just wanted to say that comrade and just again, express my appreciation to these comrades, these leaders. And you can see how we can say uh, independence and freedom and liberation in our lifetime by looking at the comrades and listening to them and uh, seeing the work that's being done in various places in the African world to make it happen. Uh, African people have to really uh, be able to believe that we can have the power, we must have the power there's nothing mysterious about power. Uh, white people exercise it all the time in our lives in a thousand different ways. And that power is one of the things that make us uh, sometimes reluctant to even get involved in the struggle. We have to have the power and African people can have the power and we can free ourselves and free the world in the process of doing that. Uhuru.